Throughout the Second World War, America built and operated an array of light and medium tanks in Europe, Africa, and the Pacific. The most famous of these include the Sherman, Stuart, and Chaffee, among many others. One thing they distinctly lacked was a vehicle to act as a heavy tank. Although technically it can be argued that the Pershing was still considered by many as a heavy tank until after the war, and an up-armored variant of that vehicle called the Super Pershing also saw limited combat in Europe, American forces did not operate heavy tanks in any significant number, unlike virtually every other nation during the war. Despite this being the case, that does not mean that there was no effort put into designing and producing a heavy tank for the US. Today we'll be looking at the first of these vehicles built after the start of the Second World War, the M6 heavy tank. Throughout history, there have been countless tanks, all designed to kill. But not all have been a success. What happened to the ones that never made it, and why did they fail? My name is Konovar. Join me as we journey through time, uncovering failed projects and forgotten creations in Cursed by Design. This episode of Cursed by Design is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for anyone looking to take their creativity to the next level. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. Whether it be improving your skills at writing, exploring better ways to create artwork, or discovering better ways to reach an audience through videos, Skillshare has something for everyone. As I transition to filming more videos and getting background footage myself, I really need to improve my understanding of my camera. Luckily, I found the class by Addie Singh on Camera Basics for Beginners, which helped me to better grasp all the ways I can improve my shoots. Go try out Skillshare now by using the link in the description, and if you're one of the first 1000 to do so, you'll get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can binge on as many topics as you want. Now let's get into today's video. Development of the vehicle that would become the M6 began in September 1939 at Aberdeen. The initial concept for the project can be found in the Ordnance Committee Minutes, OCM item 15842 from May of 1940. This describes a vehicle with a weight of around 50 tons featuring a multi-turreted design. The tank would be equipped with two primary turrets, each housing a low-velocity 76mm T6 cannon with the ability to cover about 250 degrees. This would be paired with two secondary turrets, one containing a 37mm and a 30 caliber machine gun, and the other holding a 20mm and another 30 caliber machine gun. As this is an American tank we're talking about, it was also fitted with four additional 30 caliber machine guns in ball mounts. All in all, quite a bizarre design which likely would have fared poorly as the multi-turreted designs from other nations already had. Unsurprisingly, when the project was finally approved on July 11, 1940 under the designation Heavy Tank T1, the design was revised. The new changes were laid out in October of 1940 with them being approved in late November. This eliminated the multiple turrets, instead opting for one large turret armed with a modified version of the 3-inch T9 anti-aircraft gun with a 37mm M5E1 mounted alongside it. The turret was originally planned to have powered traverse and elevation and a gyro stabilizer for the cannons, but the power elevation was later dropped. The T1 Heavy would be crewed by six tankers, with three in the hull and three in the turret. The commander would sit to the left of the 3-inch gun, with the gunner and loader sharing the right side. Behind the loader was a 50 caliber machine gun in a specialized mount, giving it 60 degrees of elevation and 5 degrees of depression. The commander would have the use of a fully traversable cupola armed with a 30 caliber machine gun. As for the crew in the hull, the driver sat to the left with an assistant driver to the right who would also act as the bow gunner. The final crew member did not have a specific role, but would likely have acted as an ammunition passer or assist with other operations between engagements. Interestingly, a few similarities with the later Soviet IS-7 can be found in the early T-1 prototype, with it being fitted with two 30 caliber machine guns with 15 degrees of elevation in fixed positions within the hull front operated by the driver. The bow gunner was given a little more to play with in the form of two 50 caliber machine guns. These could be swept 15 degrees left or right with 10 degrees of depression and 60 degrees of elevation. I think I'm beginning to see why a dedicated ammunition fetcher would be a must in this tank. To protect the men operating the machine, it was planned to have 3 inches of effective thickness on the front of both the hull and turret, with the sides and rear being between 2 and 2.5 two and inches thick. Similar to many of the pre-war or early war heavies, the tank was fairly long, coming in at just over 23 feet in length. With this immense size and respectable armor layout, it was expected that the tank would weigh in at around 50 tons. 
In order to move it along at an acceptable speed, it was determined that the engine would need to output approximately 1,000 horsepower. A number of engines were discussed, including both diesel and gasoline power plants, and in the end, the Wright G200 was selected as the primary candidate. This engine produced 960 horsepower, which was just shy of the original requirement, but was seemingly satisfactory to the design team. Now with an engine to power the tank, a transmission was needed to complete the drivetrain. Unfortunately, unlike most of the earlier elements of the T1 Heavy, there were no existing designs which could be adapted to the increased weight and therefore an entirely new system was needed. Once again, several systems were discussed, including a gas electric drive like that of the later German Maus, but due to the estimated weight being 5 tons, it was turned down in favor of a hydromatic transmission. I'll be honest, I had to google what exactly that system was, but this style of transmission was actually the first mass-produced, fully automatic gearbox, meaning the T1 would likely have been far easier to drive than many of its contemporaries. Other tanks which used this type of transmission included the likes of the M5 Stewart and Chaffee, which led to post-war advertising of the transmissions as battle-tested. Unrelated, but I found that interesting. With a finalized picture of their new heavy tank, a contract was signed in August of 1940 for a prototype with the previously chosen designation of T1. Development on the gas electric system had not stopped however, and following further development it was discovered that the system would not increase the weight as much as previously thought, only adding around 2 tons. Taking into account the advantages this design offered, it was decided in February of 1941 to install the General Motors electric transmission into the T1 Heavy prototype, redesignating it as T1E1. When the prototype was finally assembled for testing on August 19, 1941 however, neither of the planned transmissions had been delivered yet. Due to this delay, the tank was assembled in a third configuration which had been approved several months earlier. Designated T1E2, this version was assembled with a twin disc torque converter and a mechanical gearbox. With the tank now operational, testing began with reasonable success. Overall, the test drivers reportedly found the tank easy to control, although several issues were identified. By September 10th, the previous issues were resolved and it was off to the races for the T1E2 with it reaching 38 km per hour before overheating its steering brakes. This issue caused rapid wear to the brakes, meaning another pause to testing as a completely new lining was developed. Despite this, the tank had shown promise and discussions regarding production began in October. Britain had shown interest in the design, with Michael Dewar, who was head of the British mission to the US for the Lend-Lease program, saying Britain was prepared to order 500 if the program was successful. The tank came with a hefty price tag though, and by the end of October the tank had already cost the taxpayers $750,000 or nearly $14 million today. With a value like that, it's surprising Jay Leno doesn't have one of these in his garage. Obviously, this wasn't technically the cost of producing each individual tank, but the development to this point had been expensive, and with development still being funded for the gas electric drive, something needed to come out of this money pit. Following the devastating attack on Pearl Harbor, the T1E2 was officially presented to the Ordnance Department on December 8, 1941, alongside the M3 Lee. The tank put on a good show for the crowd, but unfortunately there were still many issues to be resolved, with the tank losing its power steering during the demonstration, causing it to drive the last three miles with mechanical steering. If any of you have driven something even as small as a car without power steering, you might get some idea of how much that royally sucked for the driver. Another test of the turret resulted in a pinion shaft being twisted off. Clearly more work was needed on the design, and the prototype was torn down following the demonstration for improvements. It's interesting to note that this tank was being developed alongside the M3 Lee, hence them being demonstrated together. Many people nowadays would likely not consider this fact when throwing criticism at the design for being outdated, but all things considered, it wasn't a terrible design for its day. Adding on to this, the unveiling of this tank immediately following the attack by the Japanese caused it to become a subject of media attention as is often the case with large weapons of war. This was just the beginning of its foray into the propaganda machine of the American press. Following various improvements and further testing which took place in February of 1942, the tank was finally accepted into service on April 13, 1942. It would be easy to assume that with it being originally designated as Heavy Tank T1, it would logically be accepted with the designation of Heavy Tank M1, but as there were already previous tanks with the M1 designation, it was instead given the M6 designation. In the attempts to meet the expected production prior to this acceptance, two further variations of the tank were proposed, designated T1E3 and T1E4. These both featured welded hulls rather than the cast hulls, with the E3 sharing the same drivetrain as the cast hull E2, 
and the E4 plan to use four diesel engines and a dual hydromatic transmission setup. With the hope to streamline production, it should be no surprise that the T1 E3 was the one selected with it being accepted for production as the M6A1. Both the original T1 and T1 E4 were never actually built with the hydromatic transmission never being installed into a hull although it was delivered to Aberdeen. The gas electric driven T1 E1 did see further testing and was proposed for production as the M6A2 but this was never approved. Despite this, the allure of the T1 E1 was strong and eventually it was suggested that the T1 E1 be built for use by US forces with an initial figure of 115 vehicles which was later raised to 230. M6 and M6A1 on the other hand would be provided as lend-lease vehicles to allied armies. A report in September of 1942 showed 50 M6s and 65 M6A1s being supplied to the Brits with 115 T1 E1s for the US. With production expected to start as soon as October or November of the same year, things finally seemed to be looking up for the heavy tank. Sadly, this was not to be. Exactly one year after the surprise attack by the Japanese on the 7th of December, it was decided that due to the increased weight of the tank, it was deemed to be of little tactical use. With reports from the troops in North Africa showing that many times two medium tanks were better than a single heavy tank, and the fact that the US armored force had no requirement for a heavy tank, pound the last nail into the coffin of this incredibly expensive project. With only 40 units produced, the production of America's first truly domestic heavy tank ground to a halt. Combined with the pre-production tanks, they numbered 43 vehicles in total. Although this meant no new vehicles were added to the ranks, what was being done with the already completed machines? The first production M6 was accepted in December of 1942, with the last tank, a T1E1, not being completed until February of 1944. Even though interest was lost in terms of combat use for these heavy tanks, that didn't mean they couldn't continue testing. The test reports, however, did not exactly sing the tank's praises for all to hear and were quite critical. They noted the tank's awkward crew layout which made operation of the large and small arms the tank was equipped with difficult to manage. The tank also had lost its rear-facing 50 cal and the commander's traversable cupola with the 30 cal, meaning it had little to no defense to the rear of the tank without the commander needing to risk life and limb by opening his hatch. Criticism was also thrown at the coaxial 37mm for the same reason, with it recommending that the cannon be replaced with a coaxial machine gun. Even the main 76mm was panned as inadequate for a heavy tank, although considering it was now 1943, this was definitely a valid point. Not the type to be caught off guard, the Ordnance Department had seen this coming and had installed the 90mm T7 already into the pilot T1E1. This same gun would eventually be installed as the 90mm M3 into the Pershing tank. The heavy tank was able to provide a stable platform for this weapon, however it was too little too late as the tank had been rejected by the time the report on the weapon was submitted. Fate was not quite done with the design just yet, however, and we'll discuss the final evolution of this design after a brief tangent to discuss what the M6 was used for other than a glorified earth mover. Though it never saw combat, several of the tanks were used on American soil to crush outbreaks of car-based resistance. Oh, wait, my bad, they were used as the 1940s equivalent of monster trucks to crush cars as well as other performances to raise war bonds. In a way, this makes the M6 very similar to the early World War I tanks, which were used for the very same purpose. Back in New York, a stirring Fifth War Loan Parade up Fifth Avenue. Today, the eyes of the whole world are on our armed forces. As they dig in on the French coast, we must and will dig down for that extra bond. Then in Central Park, real evidence of where our money goes. A big gun, $20,000 anti-tank gun, $6,000, heavy machine gun, $1,200. The tanks were also shown to visiting Soviets, albeit with much less freedom than the British visitors. By the time the Russians inspected the tanks, they were no longer able to be shown driving as they were partially disassembled, although there was no mention of the fact that the tank had been cancelled to them. Overall, the Russians regarded the tanks as comparable to their own similar domestic tanks. The British would also go on to use the suspension system from the T1E2 on their A33 Excelsior program, although that would similarly never see combat. Alright, now that that's wrapped up, let's take a peek behind the final door to see what this beast eventually became. Following D-Day, the Ordnance Department once again assumed that the need for a breakthrough capable heavy tank would arise. 
With the various M6 variants only gathering dust, a proposal was brought forward to eliminate the bow machine gun and driver's viewport and weld on enough steel plates to create the equivalent of 7.5 inches of armor, that's just over 190mm for those of you in Europe. This increased armor would be joined by a new turret containing the 105mm T5E1 cannon. This new turret was originally intended for the T-29 project, but it was possible to modify the original 69-inch turret ring on the T-1E1 to accept the 80-inch ring of the larger turret. Modification of 15 T-1E1s was anticipated to take only around 90 days, with the remaining 5 T-1E1s serving as spare parts for the M6A2E1 as it would become known. As before though, this design was met with the cold shoulder from both Army Ground and General Eisenhower who outright stated the 15 tanks were not wanted for use in the European campaign. This was likely a wise decision with the T1E1 showing issues when put under the increased load of the proposed 77 ton modification. Although portrayed with the increased armor in several games, the M6A2E1 was only built as a pair of prototypes for use as test platforms for the new turret and armament planned for the T29. Neither was ever equipped with the planned additional hull armor. On December 14, 1944, the M6, M6A1, and T1E1 were all classified as obsolete with all but one being sent off to the scrapyard. That sole survivor, a T1E1, remains today at the Army Ordnance Museum at Aberdeen and sadly, unless it has been restored recently, appears to be in very poor shape. So what do you think of the M6 or any of its other variations? Do you think it was foolish of the US to not use them in combat operations, or was it a wise decision to leave them as bench warmers back home? Let me know in the comments down below. If you liked this video, I highly recommend you check out my video on a design that closely followed this one but was by all accounts more absurd in its design, the T-28 Super Heavy Tank. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of my new episodes, and check out that link in the description quickly to be one of the first 1000 to claim that free month of Skillshare. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.